Welcome folks to Pedestal Loom and Auction Block Part 2, uh, which is our lecture recall that follows the lives of women in America from the period after the American Revolution, basically to the time of the Civil War. And this covers two great developments in particular. Part 1, the early Industrial Revolution or Market Revolution, uh, and the rise of a factory system of production, and now part two, the uh, spread and growth of, uh, of slavery in America during the same period, which was, uh, as we'll see, intricately connected to the Industrial Revolution of the North. It was, remember, the thread of cotton itself that both uh, literally and metaphorically connected both slavery and the factory system into one economic enterprise that we call the industrial or market revolution. And so in part two, we focus on what contemporaries at the, at the time sometimes called the peculiar institution of slavery. Peculiar, that is, by the antebellum period, mostly to the states of the South and when we say antebellum, we mean now the Latin phrase for before the war, so before the Civil War, slavery in the antebellum period, mostly in the cotton states of the South uh, before the Civil War. That's our geographic and chronological focus. Uh, before embarking on this, let me just say that Americans are as typically confused about or wrapped up in mythology over the history of slavery in our country as they are say women's history and history generally do I think to the way that we often teach the subjects uh, in the uh, schools uh, and depict the history in popular accounts such as Hollywood uh, but in looking at the American past there is no purpose or no sense in trying to deny the centrality of of slavery other than to if you'll forgive the phrase whitewash american history uh, because slavery from the very beginning of colonial settlement by england slavery was central to and instrumental in the development first of the colonies and the colonial economy uh, and then in the early republic following the American Revolution, central to the growth of America as a nation. In fact, I think it's entirely correct to say that America does not evolve as it did into a modern nation without the simultaneous growth and spread of slavery. Slavery is not something now that is separate or apart from American history. It is at the very core of America's history right up through the Civil War era in the 19th century. And, and as such, then we would also by now, I think, expect to say that so too then is women's history intricately connected with the history of slavery in this country. Now, all, all of this, of course, is perfectly straightforward to the historian based on the evidence. But because of our culture wars and political divisions uh, now uh, in America, you know, we often uh, try to repackage history to somehow fit the political or emotional need of the day. But uh, there will be no, uh, there will be none of that uh, by us this summer. We are going to take it on uh, headlong this subject because without a basic understanding uh, it's perfectly I think impossible uh, to get a, a true and, and, and honest reckoning of who we are as a nation and where we've come from. So with that uh, kind of preface you might say let's take a look at slavery and particularly the lives of women in slavery uh, in American history in the 19th century. Uh, America uh, was itself built upon the institution of slavery. Uh, that is to say, American slavery was uh, 
fueled by one of the greatest human migrations in history that from the very beginning began to imprint the population of America. And from 1500 to 1840, Africans outnumbered Europeans three to one as New World arrivals. Now let's get our heads around this for a second. From 1500 to 1840, a period of almost 350 years, the first 350 years of colonial settlement in, in the New World, and, and that would include then the beginnings of English colonial settlement in the 1600s, uh, for 350 years, it had been enslaved African peoples coming as unwilling immigrants, as captive peoples in the Atlantic trade slave that comprised the majority of New World arrivals. It wasn't Englishmen, it wasn't Europeans, it was Africans who constituted the majority of New World arrivals for almost 350 years. And yet when we think about America's history and, and the history of immigration, we think of the Statue of Liberty, we think of Ellis Island, we do not typically include in the story, the popular story, uh, the arrival uh, of African people uh, in part because of slavery itself, which seems to contradict that rosy image of America as a prime place of destination for freedom-loving people, thus the Statue of Liberty. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, three to one is the ratio. Uh, that is, for every European who came to the New World during this period, three Africans uh, also came. So uh, an enormously important imprint on the population of the New World societies of the Western Hemisphere and thus, from the beginning, African people will play an enormously important part in the development of those societies. And that's true for the United States as well. Though slavery was not exclusively the South's peculiar institution, uh, it had pretty much become so by the antebellum period. The emancipation of slaves and subsequent pro uh, prohibition of slavery uh, had been more common in the North after the American Revolution. Slavery still existed, nevertheless, in pockets of the North well into the 1830s, or, or age of Jackson, as it's sometimes known. Over 400 slaves, for example, resided in Pennsylvania by 1830, while over 2,000 did so in New Jersey. An estimated 10,000 slaves still lived in New York as late as 1820. So we should be clear about the national reach of slavery, even as we focus on the concentration of slavery in the U.S. South. And enslaved people in America were to labor in a variety of occupations and, and settings. And about 10% of those enslaved worked in commerce, trades, and industry, principally in towns and cities. For example, the Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond, Virginia was one of the biggest factories in the country. Tredegar and other factories bought and sometimes hired many slaves as laborers, paying their owners for the privilege. Hired slaves often worked under contract for a fixed period of time by agreement with the slave owner. In a similar way, enslaved women might hire out as maids, launderers, and cooks to white families by agreement with their owners. And what's the common denominator in all of this hiring of enslaved labor? Well, of course, that the vast majority of money exchanged went not to the enslaved person, but to the legally entitled owner, slave owner of that person. And, you know, sometimes when the issue of reparations for slavery comes up, people have very uh, sort of striking responses, often emotional responses, but, but just in the most basic way, you can make an economic argument that the people who labored for two and a half centuries at the very crux of our country's uh, geographical and economic development, that, that the people who labored in sweat and made possible that growth were never paid a penny. Uh, and so you can reject reparations and argument, but you cannot reject the fact of 
and uncompensated labor, whether it be in cotton fields or iron factories, uh, not for a short period of time and not just for decades, but for more than two and a half centuries, which gives a very different meaning uh, or definition to the idea of market and market revolution uh, because it was the enslaved peoples themselves who became commodities in that marketplace originating in the upper older south states of Carolina, Kentucky, and Virginia the great majority of slaves during the antebellum period uh, trekked south into the cotton districts uh, chained in what were called coffles and this was part of the American landscape for decades then. An internal migration of enslaved men and women from the Upper South, Older South regions where the uh, cash crop economies had in many respects been played out to the newer or Lower South regions to follow the growth of the cotton kingdom and thus a domestic slave trade, the buying and selling of human beings itself becomes an integral part of the market revolution uh, in the 19th century. As Sella Martin, a former slave herself, described it, a long row of men chained two and two together called a coffle and numbering about 30 persons was the first to march forth from the pen. Then came the quiet slaves, that is those who were tame in spirit and degraded. Then came the unmarried women or those without children. After these came the children who were able to walk and following them came mothers with their infants and young children in their arms. I'll let that settle in uh, for just a minute as we think about the ways that uh, popular histories have sometimes tried to either uh, you know omit or erase true memories of enslavement or otherwise romanticize the memory of slavery, uh, think about this as an antidote to that tendency. Men, women, children, mothers and infants included, forcibly marched from Virginia, Carolina, Kentucky, sometimes hundreds or even thousands of miles across open ground to the Deep South, to Alabama, to Mississippi, to Texas and Louisiana for the, sh the, the strict purpose of enslavement and uncompensated labor. That, uh, folks, is the indisputable fact of America's history in the age of the early Industrial Revolution. Families torn apart by the auction block reminded that everyone reminded everyone that slavery did not acknowledge even the most basic rights as belonging to slaves. Charles Crawley, a former slave, recalled, slaves were auctioned off to the highest bidder. Lord, Lord, I done see them young uns fought and kick like crazy folks. Child, it was pitiful to see them. Children sold away from parents, daughters, sons from their mothers, husbands from their wives, brothers from their sisters. This was the commodification of humanity in a market-oriented, capitalistic economy where cotton had become king and the profits wrung from the uncompensated labors of enslaved people defined the very essence of American historical development in this period. Elijah Davidson, a former slave, they didn't know nothing about the kin folks. Most chillin' didn't know who they pappy was, and some they mammy, cause they taken away from the mammy when she wean them and sell or trade the children to someone else so they wouldn't get attached to their mammy or pappy. So that what one scholar has called natal alienation, being torn apart from your very origins, your parents, your familial context in the name of the marketplace. And enslaved women remained outside, therefore, the spheres of true womanhood as defined by the standards of the day for free white, genteel, middle class women. By very definition, an enslaved woman could not measure up to those definitions, definitions that were geared toward free white, genteel women. So to deny one, 
the true measure of womanhood was to make it easier to treat one like a commodity, like a like a piece of property, and uh, and ninety percent. Think of this: ninety percent of enslaved women in the antebellum period labored in the fields. Ninety percent, nine out of every ten, which meant that by once again by definition they were doing labor that free white genteel women were spared uh, from doing. And thus, it was the condition of slavery itself that becomes the justification for denying these women the full measure of their womanhood. Instead, it was a balance of power and profit shaped by slave owners' treatment of their human property that defined not only the material lives of slaves, but their cultural estimation in the eyes of free white people. Consider the material circumstances. Slave cabins on the typical plantation were usually one-room structures with dirt floors and a chimney. Maybe at the end, the cabin was usually no more than about 16 by 18 feet and housed upwards of five or six people. Sometimes a loft was used as a sleeping room for children. Slave cabins generally were grouped together on a street that is, on the grounds of the plantation, along a row with several cabins facing each other across a lane. So concentrated into one part of the landed estate, uh, usually a cotton plantation, or the domestic quarters, if you will, of the enslaved laborers. Everything from the domicile to the clothes worn was very Spartan, very basic no embellishment, no flourish. It's interesting to note that one of the subspecialties of the great textile factories in the north was to produce a cheap textile clothing, uh, basic garments, tunics, and trousers that could be sold at low cost to slave owners of the south to, uh, to outfit their, their slaves. As one Georgia planner said here, the proper and usual quantity of clothes for plantation hands is two suits of cotton for spring and summer and two suits of woolen for winter, four pair of shoes, and three hats. So there it was, the basic inventory for the typical enslaved person, uh, a clothing inventory that would have to protect one from the elements, the searing sun, the driving rain, uh, the hot wind of the cotton fields. Enslaved women were equally defenseless in matters of their bodies. The term luxuries in this infamous print from the antebellum period satirically connects slave owners sexual exploitation of enslaved women with the beating of their male and female slaves that is as southern planters would often boast of the luxury of plantation life afforded to free whites one critic of slavery showed that that luxury also included the absolute power to beat and degrade and to sexually uh, assault and impose by force uh, one's own uh, sexual desires on an enslaved woman. Now this was not typically, at least the issue of sexual exploitation, was not something typically slave owners would boast of, but the evidence was, was altogether clear as children born of mixed race parentage uh, inheriting the status of the mother, slaves for life, with lighter complexions bespeaking the sexual mixing, the, the racial mixing imposed on women by the plantation system. Despite what she described as a good relationship with her master, who was a church minister, an ex-slave woman, Elizabeth, later wrote in her autobiography that her owner whipped her to subdue what he called her, quote, stubborn pride. Enslaved men, unable to defend their wives, often preferred to marry women from other plantations. As Moses Grandy recalled, no colored man wishes to live at the house where his wife lives, for he has to endure the continual misery of seeing her flogged and abused without daring to say a word in her defense. Henry Bibb said, if my wife must be exposed to the insults and licentious passions of wicked slave drivers and overseers, heaven forbid that I should be compelled to witness the sight. A famous example of a girlhood spent 
and enslavement. Harriet Jacobs, uh, who was born into slavery, but uh, managed to find, in fact, a hiding place, uh, ultimately in the home of a sympathetic neighbor, uh, and eventually find her way to freedom. Harriet Jacobs recalled, she will become prematurely knowing and evil things. Prematurely knowing and evil things. Soon she will learn to tremble when she hears her master's footfall. She will be compelled to realize she is no longer a child. So the threat of exploitation, the threat of sexual assault, was something that even as little girls enslaved uh, women were made aware of. Now this is not to say, therefore, that within the confines of the plantation that enslaved people didn't aspire to have some semblance of their own humanity, of course. What historians call fictive kinship was the desire to form families from among those enslaved, whether blood relations or not, uh, to acquire the same status as free families even if without the legal protections that free families enjoyed, observing rituals like marriages and funerals to consecrate and make good on these relationships in the slave quarters. I praise God for this day. The marriage covenant is at the foundation of all our rights, said Corporal Murray. Note the date here. This is 1866. This is a year after slavery was abolished when marriage would become for the first time in American history, a legal entitlement of black people. Never in the days of slavery were marriages between a slave man and a woman legally protected or sanctified. So not until after the Civil War will that happen, but a tradition of fictive kinship of observing rituals and rites, including funerals and marriage, will prepare the ground for former slaves to make good on the legal promise of freedom after the Civil War. Motherhood spent in enslavement was a precarious balance. After beating, after beating her, the master took away her clothes and locked them up. He kept her at work with only what she could pick up to tie on her for decency. He took away her child, which had just begun to talk. He waited to whip her until she was confined, that is, pregnant. For a used-to-be slave woman to love anything that much was dangerous, especially if it was her children she had settled on to love. The best thing was to love just a little bit. Everything, just a little bit. So when they broke its back or shoved it in a croaker sack, well, maybe you'd have a little left to love over for the next one. That from the great American novelist Toni Morrison and her great novel on the effects of slavery, Beloved. So the sanctity of motherhood, the sanctity of marriage was something denied enslaved people, even as it was touted by free whites as the most sacred of all communions. Childhood was something else that was denied by slavery. Enslaved children were put to work doing basic chores, such as cleaning up the yard around the owner's home, taking water to the adults in the fields, weeding in the cotton rows, and carrying corn to the mill. That's how Charles Crowley remembered it. Being only a boy, worked around his children, doing this and that, little things the white folks call me to do. So work, 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 right through childhood and into adulthood. That was the common denominator now of those enslaved. One could be a seamstress or uh, to sew uh, garments. One might utilize uh, experience as a birther of children to become a midwife. Uh, and sometimes, but very rarely, might it be the case that only at the very end would one be granted a kind of belated freedom to simply die on one's own and thereby, a, you know, give the slave owner really perfect liberty to take no particular responsibility uh, for the, uh, the final days of an individual who labored a lifetime. Uh, on a plantation or farm. Surrounded with them from infancy, they form a 
part of the landscape of a southern woman a southern woman's life they watch our cradles they are our companions of our sports it is they who aid our bridal decorations and they wrap us in our shrouds that was a white woman's recollection of enslaved women and the roles they played as domestics those who were not in the cotton fields remember a small minority of enslaved women were not in the cotton fields but may instead have worked as domestics in the house of the slave owner and yet you know when you hear this recollection with its kind of nostalgic memory uh, keep in mind that none of those tasks not watching the the white babies or attending as children the white children's sports or uh, being there for the great occasions in a free person's life aiding in bridal decorations as she said or even at the end of life not one of those tasks was performed you might say of one's own free will of one's own volition but as an enslaved woman one was simply required to do these things so we cannot take such uh, accounts at face value to represent somehow that enslaved people were happy in their servitude and formed important bonds with free people because the entire system was predicated again on unfreedom on uh, an involuntary requirement not on a free meeting or uh, free friendship between individuals but it's nevertheless that romanticizing from white's perspective of the relationship between slaves and uh, that is between enslaved people and slave owners families that would color the histories of slavery long after the civil war uh, that is enslaved women being framed by white perspectives what we sometimes call the mammy myth of the loyal maternal enslaved woman who not sexual in her own right but instead completely trustworthy in the house of the master and the mistress uh, to tend uh, to the family's needs usually depicted as a pious christian uh, woman whose only real concern was to do right by god and to live in humble resignation of her status as an enslaved woman uh, and yet always the mammy myth suggests that these women were devoted out of the the bigness of their hearts to the very well-being of the white children belonging to the families that enslaved them well look under duress under conditions of captivity we know that human beings are resourceful and resilient and will uh, do what they must and form relationships accordingly to survive but again never should we take on face value the fact that enslaved women were forced to do these things that somehow it was of their own free will and desire that they should do them this famous image from the motion picture gone with the wind showing the uh, african-american actress hattie mcdaniel as mammy tending to uh, the character Scarlet, played by uh, another uh, great uh, actress of the day, whose name is temporarily escaping me. <laughs> uh, Hattie McDaniel won an Academy Award for her role as Mammy in 1939. Vivian Lee, thank you, uh, memory gone but not forgotten uh, Vivian Lee played Scarlett a British actress Vivian Lee Hattie McDaniel though was the one who wins the Academy Award for her role as Mammy uh, and yet when she was uh, presented the award in Los Angeles at the ceremony she was required to sit in a segregated non-white area of the theater apart from her castmates uh, in the movie but it was then the sort of gone with the wind mythology that tended to romanticize the relationships of uh, enslaved with slave owners uh, and the recollections of the romanticized recollections of whites sometimes sought to paint that picture as an organic harmonious relationship but again the thing to keep in mind is it was entirely coercive it was not voluntary it was done under threat of grievous punishment 
and uh, again people being resourceful they will adapt to circumstances as best they can but stereotypes to uphold and justify slavery were always part of the bargain especially where women were concerned throughout the slave trade black women often were represented and observed through the European perspective that viewed them as immoral and promiscuous uh, you have on the one hand the mammy myth but you also have the Jezebel myth and the Jezebel myth held that black women were naturally sexual and lewd and inherently promiscuous but keep in mind this was a self-justifying stereotype imposed by white slave owners to entitle them to the sexual uh, liberties that their position uh, entailed that is they could take full and free advantage of the sexual exploitation of their enslaved females because they had already defined them somehow uh, according to the Jezebel myth as sexual and lewd and inherently promiscuous so one lie uh, reinforced the other you might say to create a very very difficult situation for enslaved women who had no legal or other uh, authority to resist uh, but only their wits and guile and their willingness to risk punishment the idea behind the Jezebel myth was just that as the mammy was pious and God-fearing the the Jezebel was not pious or religious and thus had no real soul it was the very counter image of the Victorian woman that was being uh, promulgated at the time of free white women in good Christian marriages as chaste and uh, modest uh, and you recall how very Victorian women like to wear long sleeves floor length gowns and garments that went right up under their chins so as to remove any trace of carnality or or, or sin from their appearance uh, while at the same time the black Jezebel enslaved woman was presented as a kind of contradiction of that image uh, here again the the cyclical and tortuous logic you know if you deny someone clothing decent clothing then you blame them for being scandalous in their appearance there's there's really no way to win and and these stereotypes will carry over even beyond slavery men and women were remember essentially defenseless from sexual and physical abuse from the uh, the devastation on on marriage relationships uh, and any other good relationships they might form the plantation mistress that is the free white southern woman the uh, the uh, wife of the slave owner had to find her own relationship to this institution given that southern laws denied free white married women any proper uh, inheritance protection uh, that is uh, it was a patriarchal system in which all legal rights of inheritance went to men which meant that for the slave owner's wife uh, an oldest son or other near male relative would have a greater claim to her property than she herself would if her husband were to die uh, no means of earning money for most free white plantation mistresses uh, if, if you were unmarried and single you were seen as a pariah educational limited uh, opportunities were limited so uh, what I'm saying here is is not that the plantation mistress lived in a condition of unfreedom uh, equivalent to an enslaved woman but only within the patriarchal legal universe of the 19th century South uh, that a free white slave owners wife or plantation mistress uh, in effect had to rely upon that very system of, of enslavement to provide her with some material necessities being that she herself was essentially not a free agent to live and act and work as she might please in other words a vicious cycle of dependence that saw the slave owner's wife accepting the cruel logic of slavery in order to secure a basic security for her own status and this was something that was pointed out by those southern women who rejected it Angelina Grimke born to a slave owning father 
rejected her own entitlement, family entitlement, as a proper Southern woman. There are female tyrants too, said Angelina Grimke, who are prompt to lay their complaints of misconduct before their husbands, brothers, and sons and urge them to commit acts of violence against their helpless slaves. In other words, what Grimke was saying here is that slavery made tyrants of everyone, including uh, the women folk, the free white slave owner's wife or daughter, whose own status in some way became dependent on that of the slave owning. Even the little child who is accustomed to wait on her mistress and her children will learn why it is that her mistress hates such and such a one among the slaves. If God has bestowed any beauty upon her, it will prove her greatest curse. That which commands admiration in a white woman only hastens the degradation of the female slave. So from childhood on, again, for women enslaved, it was a precarious and difficult line to walk. Uh, being just attractive enough, but not too attractive, being just obedient enough, but also preserving one's own sanctity. Uh, it was a tightrope between the ultimate sanction of violence and degradation that slavery held over the head of all enslaved women. All right, so uh, our conversation of the 19th century and of the experiences of women uh, both in and outside of slavery, helping us to define now the central cast of America's history uh, in the 19th century, a time when America was developing in some fundamental ways.